So today I'll uh, share a bit of uh, research that we are doing here in Manchester. So I'm talking to you from uh, University of Manchester. Uh, so Manchester is the place where, as most of you might have uh, heard or known, uh, that it's the place where, uh, where the worldwide efforts of 2D materials are spearheaded. So this is the place where um, we have our 2D materials research going on. This is the National Graphene Institute. So most of the work that I present here is also done in National Graphene Institute. So what I'm going to talk about is um, a bit related to 2D materials. So, so just as a primer, uh, so you uh, let me remind you, uh, uh, may, may many of you might already know how we make 2D materials. Uh, the, uh, the primary example being graphene. So you take a layered material, something like graphite crystal, uh, which naturally occurs as a layered material, and you take a scotch tape and peel one layer of graphene. So this one layer of graphene has many exciting properties, many superlative to its, um, to its name, and it's quite, uh, quite exotic. So what I'm interested in is not the graphene itself, but the graphite. So what if we could just imagine, what, what if we could remove one layer of graphene, not from the top, but from the middle of the crystal? So what that would leave us is a tunnel which runs through the crystal. And this uh, tunnel, has the height of the number of layers of graphene removed. And so what this leaves us is a two-dimensional empty space, which can be used for manipulation of uh, properties of matter. So this is, the, this, is the, this is the 2D capillary that I'm going to talk about, uh, so which is made up of 2D materials. And why is it interesting? Why is that uh, I'm interested in such confined uh, space? So, there are two motivations. Uh, one is um, one comes from nature. So there are protein channels which are present in cellular membranes, which have constrictions, which are of the angstrom scale dimensions. The two dimensional empty space that I'm going to talk about is also of a similar in geometric dimensions. So what do they do in, uh, uh, in cellular membranes? They regulate a lot of physiological functions. They control and uh, regulate the traffic, uh, which goes in and, in and out of the cell. So uh, there are many protein channels which can be very specific to particular molecules and particular ions. Uh, so we have like uh, some uh, specific ion channels which only let through uh, that particular ion, like potassium ion channels, which will let through only potassium, not, not the others, not the other molecules. Water channels like aquaporins, which let in only water, but block everything else. So these uh, exotic functions of protein channels are due to many, um, many reasons. But one reason is also due to the geometry. So they, ha they can control very well um, the constrictions which are, uh, which are of the molecular size. So second motivation is um, more from a technological perspective, which is on molecular separation. So I'd like to study, um, I'd like to make the capillaries which are uh, as small as molecular size and study the fundamentals which are involved in the molecular separation. So it's... Um, it's more on the fundamental science, which we can study precisely using this, um, these angstrom scale capillaries. So are, there are a lot of um, existing uh, systems which can reach nanoscale and angstrom scale dimensions. So I've tried to categorize them briefly into the dimensionality in, in terms of dimensionality. The first and foremost is simplest zero dimensional nanopores. So these are pores punched through um, either a 2D material or uh, simple conventional membrane type materials. So these, uh, these type of pores can reach few, nano, few nanometers to few tens of angstroms. So another uh, system which is very well known is nanotubes. Nanotubes can have been studied for more than, more than two decades and um, they, uh, they, they, can, uh, they have been used to both template the materials and also study the flow of molecules. So the, the reason system has been two-dimensional, two-dimensional graphene oxide and uh, related laminates, wherein the layers of um, 2D materials are stacked against each other, and the space between these layered materials can be also used as a, a capillary. But none of these systems even come close to uh, what the sophistication of protein channels are. So the protein channels are the uh, very, uh, very classic example of angstrom scale uh, channels. So how are these made in, uh, in literature? How are these uh, nanocapillaries, which are artificial nanocapillaries, made in literature? There are principally two approaches, top-down or bottom-up. So in top-down, you use a conventional lithography, uh, carve materials to create nanochannels. 
suppose uh, this is an example where the channels are made by uh, lithography on a uh, silicon so you usually use materials are silicon glass uh, so how however we cannot reach very small uh, channel dimensions so uh, mainly the reason is uh, the surface roughness dominates so if you want to go below 2 nanometers it's it's quite hard with conventional materials because the surface roughness dominates on the other hand uh, with the bottom up method you take uh, an entity which can itself act as a fluidic conduit like a carbon nanotube so it's it the carbon nanotube dimensions can be very small and it itself can act as a fluidic conduit but however if we take thousands of tubes and try to integrate them there are many problems so for instance there could be a uh, different difficulty in controlling the diameters if you have thousand tubes they may not be of the same uh, diameter and similarly if you want to integrate them into a fluidic uh, fluidic conduits uh, fluidic uh, chips like laban chip type configuration there are uh, many problems with the leaks uh, how we ensure that it's leak proof so combining combining these two methods so top down has its own merits bottom up has its own merits so combining these two uh, so we can arrive at we can arrive at very uh, nice artificial nano capillaries provided we can address the surface roughness aspect because you in any you take any surface it is going to be rough at atomic scale this is where the missing puzzle uh, can be can be nicely cleared using 2d materials 2d materials are atomically flat and make a perfect building block for making the 2d capillaries so they so ba basically the introduction in the introduction i introduced you the atom the tunnels which are inside the 2d capillaries so so basically the 2d capillaries are built using 2d materials as um, atomic scale legos so we we start the construction of 2d capillaries using uh, three layers it's like a three layer sandwich so you have a bottom layer a spacer layer which has a pre structured cavity and the top layer so combining these three layers as a sandwich leaves a uh, atomic scale capillary in the middle so um, how is this uh, even feasible so is it really you know is it really uh, possible to make such a capillary so this is a visual uh, seeing is believing right so this is a visual uh, transmission electron microscopy image of one such capillary which is a sandwich of three layers of um, graphite so you have a top graphite bottom graphite and a spacer which is two layer graphite so exactly the height of this capillary this bright white empty space that is seen here is equivalent to the height of the spacer so we can make uh, capillaries which are very tiny ranging from one layer of graphene thickness to very tall which can be few tens of nanometers so the tens of nanometer capillaries are seen here uh, number of them in parallel and uh, so this this is a quite a rectangular capillary there is no sagging on the top on from to the channel so this is all quite evident from the images and uh, so obviously there are uh, considerations which we have to take care to make sure uh, we make such open capillaries so that is the thickness of the top which induces the bending rigidity uh, to be sufficient enough not to collapse the capillaries of course we can also make capillaries which are collapsed and use them also for uh, certain purposes so there is quite a flexibility in how we make these uh, capillaries so we can uh, we can use either same materials for all the three layers of the sandwich or we can even use a different material so we could have top and bottom made of one material and the spacer to be of another material and all these three layers are kept intact by nothing but van der waals force so this is um, this is the main advantage so th there is the interface between these three layers is seamless so we can even calculate uh, the spacing here uh, between this bottom top and spacer it will be exactly as if it's a one crystal so that interfaces are seamless so it's so we can make sandwiches of these uh, 2d capillaries but how do we use them how do we use them for studying the flows so this is where our device configuration is quite an important aspect uh, for the success of this entire project so we have to uh, so we have to have a device architecture which will enable measurements so how do we do this so we do it in a membrane type uh, device uh, which is like a um, silicon nitride membrane and then so which this is silicon nitride membrane which has a hole uh, connecting the connecting which will connect eventually to the capillaries 
So on top of the silicon nitride membrane, we assemble the sandwich, the three layer sandwich, bottom, spacer. The spacer can be programmed to have one cavity or many, many cavities. This is all possible to design before. And we etch through the two layers to make the entry. And now we cover this hole with the top layer. So this is the three layer sandwich that I showed before. And now uh, what we have achieved here is entry and exit to the capillary are on either sides of the wafer. So you, you can uh, flow the liquid or flow the fluid on one side of the wafer and uh, the fluid can exit from the other side of the wafer. So this makes it quite easy to handle these uh, capillaries and we can, uh, we can actually uh, use this architecture for making a lot of measurements. So this is how the device looks like uh, in reality. So you, this is a picture of a device. So this is a silicon nitride membrane, and this is an optical microscopy image, which shows the, the membrane itself, the green colored one, and the three layers which are sandwiched. So you can, you can, you can see here the top layer, it's quite thick, uh, wantedly made thick because we don't want the capillaries to collapse. So this is how the devices look like. So, so first test is now we have made the devices, uh, we have made these uh, very tiny angstrom scale uh, capillaries. So how do we know whether these devices are even open? So we can simply do a gas leak test. So you, you take this device, which has one single capillary, which is made to have only one single capillary, and you let the gas through, and uh, you, you can test the, uh, test the gas flow. So basically what we see is they do uh, leak gas, and the samples which do not have this uh, channel, that means the spacer do not have this uh, opening. In that case, there is no, there is no uh, leak. Yeah. So there is a definite proof that this is a leak tight uh, device configuration and that angstrom channels, when they are present, they do conduct. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not it. So basically these, uh, these devices, uh, they, they conduct for a very long time. So this is one uh, important aspect. So many um, nanopores and nanocapillary systems. Um, so it's, it's quite difficult to have a long-term stability. So uh, we have monitored our capillaries. So for gas leaks, once they are made, so you make this, uh, this is day one when they are made and monitor their uh, conduction over uh, three years. So even for over three years, we can see that uh, the conduction, which is uh, the slope of this curve, basically this is the slope of this curve, which is an indication of uh, how, how conductive the devices are. They are as conductive as, like, there is some reduction in the flow, but it's, it's as conductive uh, until even three years. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is one uh, important aspect of these devices, which makes uh, shipping samples to collaborators and uh, which enable a lot of collaborative work uh, quite feasible with these capillaries. So hope uh, I've introduced the 2D uh, empty space. So let's go, let's go dwell into some of the properties that we have studied. So we have uh, taken our research in three directions, gas, water, and uh, ionic um, ions, ion flows. So I'll dwell into a few of them, uh, if not all of them. So let's uh, first uh, right away get into the gas flows. So this is, this is an interesting topic. This is a very interesting topic for many reasons. Uh, so basically we have capillaries which are of the size of the uh, molecules. So these capillaries um, uh, can be from 0.3 nanometers to any height. So let me show you first a simple example of how a gas flow measurement looks like. This is a five layer capillary. And so the only difference here in these, uh, all the graphs, uh, that all the plots that you see here, see here is that the capillary walls are made from different materials. In fact, there was a question on the Padlet uh, whether the flow will be affected. So, so I hope this will answer the question. So we have uh, here three examples. Uh, one is HBN uh, capillary, graphite capillary, and moisture capillary. So the walls are HBN, top and bottom, uh, graphite, top and bottom, uh, MOS2. And all of these have graphene spacer. So when all of them have the same height, well, one would expect that they all should have the same conduction. And this is the black line is the conduction, which is expected from the Knudsen formula. So which has geometrical consideration. You have the height in the formula, length of the capillary, width of the capillary. So all of these are kept constant and the pressure, which is also constant, the pressure difference. So how is that we have a different uh, flow for HBN capillaries and graphite capillaries? Again, they're quite similar. 
whereas a very different flow for molysulfide. Moly and in fact, molysulfide capillaries are the ones which are close to the Knudsen description. And graphite and uh, HBN show much faster uh, gas flows. So to understand this, uh, we did a length variation. So we did uh, we took same height of the capillary, but we varied the length. So when we do uh, when we do from short channels to long channels, in the case of graphite capillaries, there is no difference in the flow. Whereas in the case of molysulfide capillaries, we can see a clear cut uh, length inverse length dependence in the case of permeability. So this is what is expected. If you see the recollect the formula. Uh, the Knudsen has Knudsen formula has an inverse length relation. So molysulfide is clearly following the Knudsen description, whereas graphite uh, is not graphite and boron nitrate. They do not follow the Knudsen description. There is no. It's as if like it doesn't matter. The length of the capillary doesn't matter within the tested uh, length ranges. So uh, so this is how the Knudsen description works, right? So basically you have an infinitely long tube, long uh, wide, long narrow tubes. So you in, input a molecule, it undergoes series of diffuse reflections and exits the pipe. So this is what is the basic assumption of the Knudsen description. Whereas in the case of, um, so while this is so in the case of uh, molysulfide, in the case of graphite, we see a clearly enhanced flow and we think it is because of the clear uh, specular scattering. And why this? Uh, why do we think so? Because we also don't have any length dependence. So that means these uh, reflections are quite specular, and they do not have any loss of momentum. So this leads to an increased flow. So compared uh, to the electron uh, density maps here, so basically what uh, we can see is due to the sulfur projection on the moly atom, the rough uh, the surface is quite uh, rough for moly sulfide compared to the graphene and boron nitride so although all uh, all are atomically flat surfaces there is a small difference and this small difference is enough to contribute to this um, observed specular versus diffuse reflection and how does this uh, how does this even manifest because we have a molecule which is which is quite large so the size of the helium molecule is about uh, 2.2.6 uh, angstroms so and the size of these pipes is 1.7 nanometers so it should easily pass through and uh, so how is this small roughness of one angstrom uh, manifested in here uh, with the scattering? So that's only possible if we have to consider de Broglie wavelength of the molecule. So this is, uh, the, this is not a particle which is influencing, it's the wave-like nature of the particle. So, and we can test this with a molecule which has a different de Broglie wavelength and uh, keep the same materials. Uh, so we did this with hydrogen and deuterium and we can indeed see that when the roughness of the molecule, roughness of the surface is comparable to the de Broglie wavelength, then you can see this um, diffuse reflection. That means if you are sending, a, uh, if you are sending a molecule which has a large de Broglie wavelength and this, uh, this surface would look more smoother to it. So you have a small ball and um, a large corrugation, then you would feel it. If you have a large ball, and a very uh, same like small corrugation the ball would not feel the corrugations it's like a it's just imagine a ping pong ball uh, going through a tube the tube has very small corrugations the tube uh, the the pipe uh, ha surface has very small corrugations then the, the ping pong ball would not feel it but if the ball itself is small then it would feel the corrugations so this was quite a nice demonstration of uh, wave like nature of the uh, molecules which are trans which are transported through these capillaries having an effect so i spoke so much about newton description right so we are uh, applying newton description for very small scale uh, upper, uh, very small scale pipes but originally when newton description was uh, derived over a century ago so this is these are very quite um, old uh, formulae which have been valid so whether these descriptions are even valid for our systems so this is a question which comes up so are we able to even uh, apply these mathematical descriptions and think that you know we should have um, uh, we have enhanced flows so this is a nice thing to verify right so whether we have it valid for atomic scale apertures or not so for doing this so we we took a simple system not a pipe uh, but simple rather a simple system which is a pore so 
and validate. So idea is to validate whether uh, notes and description is applicable or not. So to do this, we collaborated with um, Pennsylvania uh, group, Professor Maria Dundich group, and they, they are experts in making these uh, systems where they can knock off atoms through atoms from a single layer of uh, uh, time, transition metal dichalcogenides. This is a WS2 monolayer from which uh, tungsten atoms are removed. So these are atomic scale apertures, basically. So when we let the gas flow through these apertures, we can simply, um, we can do the same type of measurements that we did before. And we can increase the number of these pores. So these are like each one is an atomic scale pore. So we can have samples which have more number of pores to small pores. That's the difference between sample one, two, three here. The one has more number of pores compared to number three. So this one has 2000 pores compared to, I think roughly around 1000 in the sample three. So we can verify that it is indeed correlating with the number of pores. And now let's put the Newton description. So which is uh, written here for the case of uh, pore. So, mm, so basically there is no length and other aspects here because it's a pore, it's only the area uh, which is given. So uh, these pink bars are the ones which are from the experiments and the gray bars are from the Newton formula. And surprisingly, what we can see here is there is a very good correlation between the Knudsen formula and the experimentally observed uh, the fluxes. Yeah, and these are for three different cases. And the controls, which are uh, blank substrates without any pores, are below our detection limit. So indeed, the flow is through the pores, uh, which are atomic, basically atomic vacancies. And uh, we can nicely correlate. So you also see there is a small difference uh, here. There, there are color in the, there are different colors in this bar, which is in the Knudsen description. So we try to do this because there is a difference. Uh, there is a distribution of the pores in experiments. When uh, the pores are made, not all pores are same, right? There could be a difference in the number of uh, uh, number of uh, atoms that are knocked. So in a in a single system, in a single sample, we can have one tungsten vacancy, or two tungsten vacancies, or three tungsten vacancies. But we can know what is their distribution. So this will have a different pore size. Suppose three tungstens are knocked, there will be a different uh, pore size. So, but we can know their distributions from the TM images. So the so because we know there are more number of uh, one tungsten and two tungsten vacancies. So we can adjust this in the calculation, in the notion description. So those are the, uh, sorry, those are the adjusted. So this uh, gray bar is one, one plus two tungsten and then this blue bar is the uh, three tungsten. So what we arrive at from this particular study is even we take uh, about atomic scale aperture, which is uh, made from single atom to uh, few atom vacancies, we can still apply the Knudsen formula. So this is the first time one has validated the Knudsen description per experimentally by straight comparison uh, to atomic scale systems, rather than simply because these were mathematical formula which were derived for uh, you know simple uh, infinite tubes and you know simple apertures, but not really validated in experiments. And another thing which also is uh, evident from this work is usually when such pores systems are made, um, it's quite difficult to know whether there are pores or not on a large scale. Usual uh, way to quantify them is by TEM. As uh, one may know, transmission electron microscopy is not going to be applicable for large areas. So here we have a way with to, to simply estimate pore densities from the gas flows. So we can back calculate. So once we know the gas flows, we can back calculate and uh, correlate with the TM uh, inspection. So this gives a very nice tool to uh, inspect large areas of such new systems, which are angstrom scale pores. So let me switch the gears back. So we have uh, dwelled into gas flows. So um, I'll go back to now other flows, other molecular flows using angstrom scale capillaries. So, um, so basically we are switching back to the angstrom scale capillaries. Uh, and uh, looking at liquid flows. So first question is, uh, among all liquids, the primary, um, the most important liquid is water. So in, in our case, we just wanted to know first whether water flows through these capillaries. And how do we do these experiments? So we have to flow the water and measure the water output. So we have chosen a simple way to do this, that is microgravimetry. So uh, again, this is uh, very simple to do. So basically you have a, a silicon nitride ship which has capillaries. And you cover a container of water. So this is the container of water. It's a very, sim very simple aluminum container. And uh, 
if you leave this container open the water will evaporate right and then you can see the uh, weight of the water will reduce so if you uh, this is the weight of the water that we are monitoring so you have certain amount of water to start with and as it evaporates it will reduce but however if you seal this container with the capillaries and the only way the water can evaporate is through the capillaries so that can give us uh, if there is a water uh, reduction water weight reduction that will give us a estimate of water flow so basically so what we have is a very small tiny water flow which is monitored using a microbalance so the precision of the microbalance has to be extremely good so this is where we have a seven digit balance so we can look at a micrograms uh, precision and all of this is done at a very controlled temperature and humidity to ensure we have a consistent results so how does the measurement look like this is how it looks so we have a zero uh, not zero essentially one weight to start with which is normalized uh, here to look as zero and so from the base weight the there is a reduction in the weight of the water that's that's a indication of how much water has flown through these capillaries and uh, so what we see is over 3 days uh, of monitoring we can see the water has uh, reduced about 0.8 mg these are through a capillaries which are 1 nanometers and in a single device we had 200 channels so from this we can simply estimate using the slope of this curve we can simply estimate so we can simply estimate what is the water flow water flow through these capillaries so uh, this is how um, this is how it is done and basically we can vary the length again to understand how the water flow mechanism is so we take the same height of the capillary and look at how the water flow varies with the length is it uh, inversely proportional or is it is it like is it independent so what we see here is the water flow is is inversely proportional to the length and the error bars um, indicate the vertical error bars indicate the reproducibility so basically we have six devices in this uh, six devices shown in this uh, inset and these six devices have same length uh, but um, they are made in different batches so we can see it's quite reproducible so from this uh, water flow rates we can arrive at the velocity of water so when we calculate the velocity of water what we see here is the velo velocity of water is extremely high it can go up to 1 meters per second even through such tiny capillaries it can nearly move frictionless as the surfaces are quite atomically flat so the the it's it's frictionless and it can it can go at a very fast speed so we have established that water can flow through these capillaries at extremely fast uh, speeds so the immediate question is uh, if we have salt water can we exclude the salt and let the water through by con by tuning the size of the capillaries and uh, as one might know it's much easier to dissolve the salt rather than uh, rather than remove it which is a more energetic process so so we have to see how our size exclusion works so for this we started with capillaries which are again we can tune the height of the capillaries very well so we started with capillaries which are made from bilayer graphene with a size of 6.7 angstroms the reason why we chose this is because it's quite close to the size of the common salts the common salts like sodium chloride uh, potassium chloride these ions have a similar uh, hydrated diameter the diameter which includes the ionic size and the shell of water around it is about 6 angstroms so with this reason we started uh, so letting in ionic solutions through these capillaries and the measurements are done by electrochemistry so basically you put two electrodes and look at the ionic currents so from uh, from uh, various measurements including diffusion of salts we arrive at mobility of the uh, ions so on the x axis here you see different ions which are uh, which are represented by hydrated diameters starting from potassium to uh, even indium and aluminum so the size of the Uh, pipe is about 6.7 but the ion which is uh, the ball here is varying to up to 9.6 that means the ball is much larger than the pipe but surprisingly we did not have an exclusion the even the larger balls which are 9.6 angstroms they could go through this pipe only with a reduced mobility these red dots are the mobilities inside the pipe whereas these blue dots are how it is in the bulk so we can see there is a still even though it's an order of magnitude lower mobility it still goes through the capillary that's a surprise so this hydration shells which which are surrounding the ions can squeeze and uh, they can still go through the capillaries so this was one uh, one interesting observation but we were not able to exclude the ions and um, 
Second thing which we noticed in this study is all of these uh, positive ions have a counter ion. So it's a salt which has both anion and cation. So the cation was the, is indicated here. The anion is always chloride. Chloride uh, being it's it's being the same in all of them, right? So we should have same mobility for chloride. So we do have same mobility for chloride in all of these measurements, but it is lower than the bulk. It's it's almost three times lower than the bulk. And if you see this particular point of KCl, um, so basically, if if you see this point of KCl, the potassium and chloride have similar sizes. Although positive ion is affected, positive, positive ion is unaffected. That is potassium bulk and confined mobilities because you have the same size, the pipe and the ion, it is the same size. The positive ion is unaffected. Negative ion is being affected. So this is a surprising result uh, that we could see. So it's not just the size of the ion, but also the configuration of water molecules, uh, whether um, they are their oxygen pointing towards the surface or hydrogen is pointing towards the surface that can also affect their mobility inside the confined spaces so but however we are not able to exclude any ions so we have to reduce our pipe size even even smaller so so far we have tried up to size uh, where the ion is larger larger only a few times so it's not um, it's not enough so we had to reduce the pipe size even smaller. So make it the ultimate what we can make, which is 3.4 angstroms, single layer thickness of graphene. And now we try to exclude the ions. So we can see that we can exclude all of the ions except um, HCl. So this is a, this is a very uh, different scenario where H, H plus is not an ion. It's, it's more, uh, it, it goes by a very different mechanism, but however, we can exclude all the ions like sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and still water flows through these uh, capillaries, and we could avoid all the ions going through these capillaries. So it's comparable with um, the dimensions of these capillaries are comparable with aquaporin. This is a very nice comparison to make here because one may wonder why one has to have such narrow restrictions to uh, for the functioning of aquaporins, so where, which let only water flow through. So they, maybe this is the reason we cannot have any exclusion if we have any larger capillaries or any larger spaces. So you need to have very small arrive at this kind of dimensions to completely exclude all the ions. So now let's come to protons. So all of the ions flow like uh, ion dressed in hydration shells. This is how uh, all the ions flow. But in the case of protons, they do not move as hydrated ions, but rather they move by making and breaking the bonds. So they, the proton hops from one water molecule to another water molecule to make and break the bonds. This is again a very classical mechanism known very well, uh, called as Grothus mechanism, more than a century old. So, so this is how the protons move. And we can see the proton has a finite conduction. So although it has a finite conduction, so let's compare it with bulk. So we have a reference, which is our uh, two layer devices. The pipe size is much larger, twice larger and we have monolayer devices. So uh, in the case of monolayer devices, this is uh, with respect to concentration of the chloride HCl. So we can see it's almost one order of magnitude lower. So it has a finite conductance, but it's not as much as bulk. So what is happening? So if you now let look at the possibilities of water, uh, possibilities of the water conduction, um, so possibilities of the water conduction through these capillaries. So we have a case of two dimensional water in our capillaries because there is only space for one layer of water because physically there is only 3.4 angstrom space and the water molecule is 2.8 angstrom. So we cannot fit in any neighbors but the water molecules on top or below. So it has only one uh, water molecule layer. And in the case of 3D water, we can have any number of neighbors. So let's look at the diffusion coefficients. So in the case, of our channels from the measurements, we arrived at a diffusion coefficient, which is much lower than the bulk water. And now let's compare it with one dimensional water, which is from nanotubes. So which have the highest diffusion coefficient compared to even 3D and 2D. So here uh, the case is very simple. You always have a site for the proton to hop to make and break the bonds. So in the case of 3D, it is also feasible. There are always some free mo water molecules which are uh, possible to make and break the bonds. But in the case of 2D, because of their restriction to two-dimensional nature, so we do not have an uh, easy way to per proton to make and break the bonds and travel. This is the reason why 
we think we have the slowest diffusion in our capillaries in a way we have um, we have made some sort of a two dimensional water which is highly ordered uh, and further investigations are underway so uh, so with that i would uh, with that oh, okay so now it's now the gif is working so you can see this is how the proton migrates so so uh, let me end with a few further investigations of angstrom capillaries which i do not have time to dwell on in this uh, talk but uh, we have many more interesting studies going on with angstrom capillaries so in one case we could uh, make fluidic transistor type uh, device so wherein we have um, so this is a capillary wherein we we have ionic flows triggered by pressure so this is a pressure induced flow and voltage acts as a gate so similar to solid state transistors so wherein you have a gate terminal so here we have a voltage acting as a gate across the channel and pressure acting as a source drain so you can you induce ionic flows by pressure and uh, tune them by voltage that's how the graph looks like this is the mobility of the ions and so with the source drain with the uh, zero voltage the zero voltage we have this uh, we have a very very small you know we have the zero point where very very small mobility and you apply the voltage you can tune you can tune the mobility of the ions inside you can tune it up to 20 times so this is um, uh, again feasible because of our uh, constructions which are two dimensional in nature so we could um, coordinate the ionic motion which is induced by pressure uh, with the voltage so this is a kind of a transistor which is um, uh, working on electrohydrodynamics effect and this is quite sensitive to the surface of the material so we have frictionless motion on graphite so we can have a high gate effect whereas on other surfaces where we do not have such frictionless motion we cannot induce such high gating effects so uh, in another recent work we could also uh, translocate biomolecules and study their interesting biophysics so this is an example where we would where we uh, induced uh, motion of uh, dna uh, uh, dna which is again dna translocation is a very important aspect for many of the nanopore sequencing uh, experiments so we induced their motion through constrictions of these uh, 2d slits and uh, so what we saw is very different from what is observed in nanopores so we we could see the entropic barrier for the entry of this dna so first of all there is a huge entropic barrier for the dna entry so we uh, so we can tune this dna entry uh, height that is the height of the capillary and almost the twice the size of the dna is required for the entry so if you assume the dna uh, entry width is about 2 nanometers we had to go up to 4 to 5 nanometers capillaries to even induce the entry otherwise the entropic barrier is too high for it to enter and when it is inside the when it is inside the capillary it can slide through with less friction through graphite capillaries so and how do we know this we can uh, we, if we have knots or uh, uh, knots through the dna so they they slide through without any hindrance so this is all visible in the curves again this is a collaborative work with professor k sticker and y nayan and all the simulations were provided by alexi so hope i have convinced you that we have demonstrated a state of the art angstrofluidic system which can be a very nice platform for studying exceptional physics and we have the precision to uh, confine one molecular layer which opens avenues for new types of Uh, new types of uh, applications and all of this work has been done in collaboration with many groups uh, and i could not thank them enough so i i would like to thank all my collaborators professor andragaim professor lidrik buke professor maria drindej professor kees decker and all my collaborator uh, collaborative workers so it's uh, it has been it was very very fun working with them all through, throughout all these projects uh, i'd like to thank gopinathan ali ashok timothy vaine and for all the beautiful microscopy images that you saw it is all from sara hague and uh, aidin so it's uh, it's the most beautiful pictures that uh, from all of this work so thanks to sara uh, who was also a speaker in carbon line hagen i think last year so thanks to all my theory collaborators peng chao and mehdi um, and priyanka paul for the extrapore samples and many many more uh, many more who have worked through all uh, all of these projects i thank my group and funders Uh, and i'd like to thank you for your attention mm -hmm.